I wanted to ask if you could talk a bit about um, the importance of studying women's counter storytelling as a form of resistance. I think through all of my research, I've always been in really interested. I think that's the thread of my research. Um, and I hope it's not starting to get kind of pedantic that I'm always interested in talking back. So uh, studying women's experiences of depression and then recovery. So while we know that women certainly are much more likely than, than men to experience depression, we also know that they get through. So how, what's going on? What helps? How can we support women in their processes toward living well. Um, Sue Mackenzie Moore is a colleague and a dear friend in the social work department at St. Thomas University and her research, uh, we didn't even know uh, each other when we were doing our, our respective programs of research, but her research looked at women's experiences of rape and she asked it about um, women who identified with the concept of living well after rape. And so our research projects really mirrored each other in a lot of ways. Uh, and through our ongoing conversations about our research, we got very excited about resistance and, and how do we resist dominant discourses uh, in our lives in a variety of different ways. Um, I subsequently did some research on self-care. So if depletion and self-negation was a, a process that invited a lot of women or that was implicated in a lot of women's experiences of, uh, of depression, then how do women manage to kind of take care of themselves? So that, I'm not explaining that fully, but, um, so I was looking at self-care. That's another kind of place of resistance, um, that, and, and leisure as a form of resistance that I've, I've looked at. Um, and I, we're not published, well, it's in Revise and Resubmit, a couple in Revise and Resubmit, uh, with Dr. Stelzel, Monica Stelzel. We're doing a study on women's uh, experiences of faking orgasm and not doing this normative act. So I've just always been interested um, in not only how dominant discourses uh, shape our subjectivities and our experiences, but also the room for, for resistance. So that's been a... I think probably the most dominant thread in the research that that I've done. Can you talk a little bit about how you came to resistance? <clears throat> What's the like focus? Hmm. How did I? Um. Somehow, I just think it's. I just always wanted to know. Kind of the more positive end of, of this. I think we've had this really rich legacy of scholarship that's clearly documented and very richly documented um, the ways in which we're oppressed by hegemony, but how, you know, the Foucauldian line, right, where there's resistance, or where there's power, there's resistance. I'm always just really interested in what can we do? How can we push back? Um, so, yeah, I, I'm not... Mm. I think it's kind of unfolded, but I've always just been interested in, okay, so what? What can we do? Mm. Um, so, uh, much of your research through you uh, involves discursive analysis. Uh, yeah. How did you uh, start using that methodology? Uh, working with Janet, um, <laughs> just thinking back to my interview with her just to get into graduate school and, and God love her. She uh, said, what's your epistemological position? And I was like fresh out of, un I'm like, I don't know, what are you talking about? Uh, and so we talked it out about, you know, she was asking me some questions. Um, and so I was able to spend a good long time exploring epistemology and ontology and, and um, I'm sure I slowed down my research program by diving into all of that, but I thought I have to figure this out first before I can move forward. And so from my explorations of, of epistemology and ontology, I, I then got to a place where I felt comfortable that I, I, I knew where I was standing. And um, from a postmodern critical realist, social constructionist critical realist perspective, um, then I was looking at, okay, what methodologies are going to enable me to ask the questions that I'm, I want to ask from that place. So discourse analysis, and then I had to do the whole thing about discourse analysis, what kinds of discourse analysis can they be combined, which different approaches, um, and so arrived finally at um, 
Uh, Margaret Weatherall has a, a paper looking at combined approach, kind of Foucauldian analysis with conversational analysis, and I'm really compelled by those approaches that that are able to hold both again here we go holding both uh approaches to discourse analysis um maybe before we move on if you could talk about what do you feel that a discourse analysis brings to psychology in general um but maybe feminist psychology also in particular for me it's been really central because it allows um it allows a deeper exploration of of for me of power um, than um, positivist approaches have it, it's just more compelling to me in that way it's almost you're able to join with the person who's speaking and empathize and believe and support and I think I think it's getting back to that idea that I was just talking about earlier about being able to to respect uh, individuals accounts of their own lives and deconstruct and unpack uh, at the same time. So you almost, you can have multiple layers of analysis going on uh, at the same time, so.